Much has been said about the importance of the Gospel of Matthew. If you look at commentaries about Matthew, they have a lot to say about the book. One says, when we turn to Matthew, we turn to the book which may well be called the most important single document of the Christian faith. For in it we have the fullest and most systematic account of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. Another writes, all things considered, the first gospel is perhaps the most powerful document ever written. For most of Christianity's history, Matthew has been the most popular of the four gospel accounts. It contains the greatest quantity of Jesus' teachings, including some of his most beloved parables, including his most famous sermons, uh, particularly the most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, which contains some of his most well-known teachings, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, the Golden Rule. Matthew contains the greatest number of links between the Old and the New Testament. Only Matthew records certain key events in the life of Christ. Joseph's vision, the visit of the wise men, the flight to Egypt, killing the infants in Bethlehem, the dream of Pilate's wife, the suicide of Judas, the resurrection of the dead at the crucifixion, the story of the bribed guard, and the Great Commission. Those are not found in the other Gospels. Matthew has always been seen as a pivotal book in understanding the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's placed first in the, even the earliest collections of the New Testament books. They've never found a collection of New Testament books that didn't have Matthew placed first. Matthew demonstrates repeatedly throughout the book that the hopes, the prophecies, the promises of the Old Testament had been fulfilled in Christ. Matthew, of course, has always had a special status with the missionary and the evangelistic outreach because of the prominent placement of the Great Commission at the climactic end of Matthew's gospel account. It's Jesus' final command, and that command, more than any other, has caused the church throughout the years to look outward and to spread the gospel to all the world. No one doubts the importance of Matthew. And yet among modern scholars, Matthew today holds a second place to, for example, Mark. And we'll talk in a moment about why they, why they think that. But let's look, look first at the structure of Matthew. There are many ways to outline or to look at the structure of Matthew. Many outlines revolve around the five large collections of Jesus' teachings that we find in the book. Each of them ends with the same phrase, when Jesus had come to the end of these sayings. And each time you see that phrase, that's a pivotal point in the book of Matthew, and it occurs five times. Chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 19, and chapter 26. And in each case, you have a change, a transition uh, in the ministry of Christ. One commentator suggested that this five-fold division was intended by Matthew to be a counterpart to the five books of Moses. And in fact, that Matthew was, was, was looking to Jesus as kind of the new Moses, bringing the new law. Uh, that was what this commentator suggested. Others divide the book geographically, with the first phase in Galilee, and then the trip from Galilee to Ju Jerusalem, and then the final phase in Jerusalem. That's another way to divide the book. There are many ways to look at the book of Matthew and to provide a structure. And any time you pick up a commentary, you're likely to see a different way of outlining and structuring the book. But those are two that look particularly interesting to me. Let's look now at the world of Matthew. Although the message of Matthew is ageless, we need to remember that the book was written at a particular time and at a particular place for a particular intended initial audience. And Understanding that will help us understand that ageless, timeless message of Matthew. I think many, many of us look at the Bible, look at the New Testament, and look at the Jews and assume that they were just some undifferentiated community living there in the Holy Land, all kind of together, all kind of the same, with a common enemy, the Romans. But that's really not the way it was at all. In fact, one commentary says that's a gross distortion of the way it really was. Galilee, in particular, was very different from Judea, the southern province of Judea, where Jerusalem was found. Galilee was very different from Judea. And of course, Jesus came from Galilee. Let's look at the differences between those two. 
Racially, there were some differences. The area of the northern kingdom, the former northern kingdom of Israel, had since the Assyrian invasion, many, many years prior to the time Matthew was written, uh, had been more mixed, a more mixed population. Uh, and in fact, conservative Jewish areas such as Nazareth and Capernaum were situated very close to large pagan cities such as Tiberias, very close, very mixed population. Geographically, they were different. Of course, Galilee was up north, Judea was down south, but in between was Samaria, which was a non-Jewish area in between the two. So they were separated geographically. Politically, they were very different. Galilee had been under a separate rulership or administration going all the way back to the 10th century B.C., except for a very brief period of time under the Maccabees, they had had different rulers. In fact, even now, when this was written, Galilee was under the rule of the Herods. And of course, Judea was under the rule of the Roman prefect. So even at this time, they had political differences. Economically, they were different. Galilee had better agriculture, better fishing, and they had more wealth than the southern mountainous regions that did not have that kind of agriculture. So in fact, a lot of times the south would kind of look with envy up at the wealth of the north. Culturally, they were different. Judeans despised their northern neighbors as country cousins. They particularly disliked their lack of what they saw as a lack of Jewish sophistication uh, combined with what they also saw as a greater openness to Greek culture up north. So they didn't like that at all. Very different culture. Linguistically, they were different. The Galileans spoke a very distinctive form of Aramaic. It was an accent. Don't we see that in Matthew 26, verse 73? Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you, she said to Peter. Religiously, they were also different. The Judean opinion was that the Galileans were lax in their observance of the law and of the Jewish ritual. So there were huge differences between the north, where Jesus came from, from teaching from Galilee, and the south, where Jerusalem was located. The closest modern parallel between Galilee and Judea may be to compare them to Texas and New York. I kind of like that comparison because, of course, that would mean Jesus is from Texas. <laughs> <clears throat> what these differences mean, though, is that even an impeccably Jewish Galilean in the first century Jerusalem was not among his own people. It'd be like a Texan going up to New York. He was, as one commentator described it, as much a foreigner as an Irishman in London or a Texan in New York. His accent would immediately mark him out as not one of us. No matter what message he had to proclaim, Jesus would first have to fight through those prejudices. As the people asked in John 7, verse 41, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Well, they, I'm sure, were not the only ones to ask that question. There was bound to be tension between the Galilean prophet and Jerusalem establishment, and we see that tension throughout the Gospels. Each Gospel account shows the southern capital rejecting and killing the northern prophet. Do you remember the very first thing that Nathanael said about Jesus? John 1, verse 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You can be very sure he was not the only person to ask that question. One commentator said, to read Matthew in blissful ignorance of first century Palestinian sociopolitics is to miss the point. This is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, one of the central prophecies in Matthew that Matthew points back to is the prophecy in 2 verse 23, he shall be called a Nazarene. Where is that prophecy in the Old Testament? You will not find one with those exact words anywhere in the Old Testament. What was Matthew pointing to? Did he blunder? Of course not. Absolutely not. 
but I don't have time today to go through why he didn't. So I'm going to ask you to look at the website to read the notes on that prophecy in 2 verse 23. But I will add one interesting footnote to this. Do you remember when Jesus appeared to Saul, later Paul, on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter two, 20, uh, 22, it's recounted in Acts chapter 22, verse 8, how he identified himself to Saul? I am Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Saul's opinion of Nazareth likely changed on that road, as did many other things about Saul on that road to Damascus. Who is the author of Matthew? Sounds like a question, who is buried in Grant's tomb? But it's a little more complicated than that. Despite the title on the first page of the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Matthew was most likely anonymous, meaning that it didn't have someone's name attached to it from the beginning. It's possible it did. Some commentaries think it did, and maybe it did. But most people think that the titles you see there is, is, was not part of the original text. But attribution of this gospel to Matthew the Apostle goes all the way back to the earliest surviving extra-biblical evidence. There is no evidence that any other author was ever proposed for the gospel of Matthew. And in fact, let's look at that question from the other side. Let's look at it from the other side. If Matthew were not the author, why would anyone ever have attached his name to this book? After all, Matthew, also called Levi, uh, was otherwise a very little-known apostle who, from Jewish standards, had a very unscrupulous past. We'll talk about in just a moment. And in fact, you could also ask that same question about Mark and Luke. Why would anyone have attached Mark's name to a gospel? He's best known for abandoning Paul. Why would anyone have ever attached Luke's name to a gospel if he didn't write it? He's a very obscure uh, person in the New Testament, only mentioned by name one time. Mark wrote his gospel, Luke wrote his gospel, Matthew the apostle wrote his gospel. There's no other explanation for why their names are attached to those gospel accounts. The best conclusion from all the evidence is that Matthew the apostle wrote the gospel of Matthew. Well, who was Matthew the apostle? Who was Matthew the person? The list of 12 apostles in Matthew's Gospels refers to him as Matthew the tax collector in chapter 10. It tells us in chapter 9 how he was called while sitting at his tax booth. Uh, Luke and Mark refer to him as Levi. Most likely his name was changed to Matthew, meaning the gift of God, after he was called by Jesus. The booth from which Matthew was called was probably located on one of the main highways near Capernaum from which Matthew then would have been collecting tolls for Herod Antipas. We all know about tax collectors or publicans and how they were viewed. They were numerous. They were usually dishonest. They were employed by the hated Romans to collect taxes for faraway Rome. And in fact, they were usually seen as the real enemy because you generally didn't see the Romans or, the, or even Herod, but you could see the tax collector. They're the ones that showed up asking for, for money. Rome didn't collect its own taxes. Instead, they farmed it out. And the tax rate was not publicized. You didn't really know what the rate was, so the tax collector could get as much as he could get, and he could keep anything extra, which is why most of them were very, very wealthy. A man without a conscience could easily become very rich under that system, and most of them did. But we should note that unlike another famous tax collector in Luke chapter 19, there's no indication here that Matthew had to repay anybody anything. So although he was apparently wealthy, he gives a very large banquet in his home. We have no direct evidence for believing he was dishonest, um, although most were. And like wealthy career politicians today, we have to kind of wonder where the money came from. Uh, but there's no direct evidence that Matthew was dishonest. Certainly he was not after he left that all behind and followed Christ. It's interesting that after his name appears on the list of apostles, Matthew disappears from the history of the church recorded in the New Testament. His last mention in the Bible, Acts chapter 1, where he's pictured there in the upper room, and that's it. He's best known for writing this gospel, gospel account. Otherwise, he would have been almost entirely unknown. Why did Jesus call Matthew? Well, most of the disciples were fishermen. 
They had little skill and little practice in putting words down on paper. But Matthew would have been an expert in that. When Jesus called Matthew as he sat there at the booth taking in taxes, Matthew rose up and followed Christ and left everything behind except for one thing. He took his pen and he wrote down what he heard and what he saw and he gave us this gospel account. When was Matthew written? The almost unanimous view until the middle of the 19th century, when we all suddenly became much smarter, apparently, was that Matthew was the earliest gospel to be written. In fact, among the early lists and texts, the one constant factor is that Matthew is always listed first. Always listed first. It was thought to be the earliest gospel to be written. But then... 19th century comes along, as I mentioned, we all became so much smarter, apparently, and scholars started looking at this and saying, no, Matthew was not the earliest one to be written. And they started saying that Mark was the earliest gospel to be written. Why? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Not John, just Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And synoptic comes from two Greek words meaning to see together. And why they're called that is because you can put them down and compare them. We see it, for example, in harmonies of the Gospels that you may have in the back of your Bible. The fact that we can do that is why these are called synoptic Gospels. Um, the relationship among the first three Gospels is one of the biggest debates in New Testament scholarship, and it's known as the synoptic problem. Well, why is it called a problem? Well, the answer to that question has changed over the years. In older commentaries, the supposed problem involved the differences among the Gospels and how they could be reconciled. And that's very often why we had the harmonies of setting them side by side. But under modern criticism, the supposed problem is not the differences, but the similarities among the Gospels and how they can be explained. And that's why they call it a problem. How do we explain the similarities? Well, some argue that the correspondence between these first three Gospels, particularly, is so close, they say, that we must conclude that they all came from some common source that we don't have anymore, or one or two copied from the others. That's what they say. We have to conclude that, they say, because they're just so similar. And when they look at that, they decide that Mark must be the earliest, because they say Matthew and Luke must have copied from Mark, so it must have come first. Well, was Mark the earliest gospel? Modern critics answer that question with a resounding yes. And they base that conclusion, as I mentioned, on the similarities between Mark and, the, and, the, and Matthew and Luke. But what they fail to mention is that much of that similarity comes from the actual words of Jesus, uh, where the agreement among the gospels runs close to 100%. And isn't that what we would expect when they're quoting the actual words of Christ? Also, when we look below the surface similarities, we find some very interesting differences among the first three Gospels. First, the language is different. If they were just copying wholesale from Mark, as we're told to believe, wouldn't you think they'd be using all the same words that are found in Mark? Well, they don't. In fact, of the first three Gospels, they have only a over, little over 60% in common with the words in Mark. Uh, that seemed a little strange if they were just picking it up and copying it down. Second, we would be wrong to conclude that Matthew simply took Mark and expanded on it, for example, as we're often kind of led to believe. Well, he took Mark and he looked at it and he, he added a bunch of stuff to it. In fact, when Matthew and Mark share a narrative, Matthew is almost always shorter than Mark. Uh, in fact, for an example, look at the story of the woman with the hemorrhage. Mark tells that in 154 words. Luke, 114 words. Matthew, 48 words. So Matthew's just copying from Mark? Those who argue that Mark came first say that if Matthew came first, then there would have been no need for Mark to ever write his gospel. Because we already had Matthew. Why would then Mark write his gospel if we already had Matthew? But how can anyone possibly argue that if they've read Matthew and Mark. I mean, how can you possibly read Matthew and Mark and say, well, we can do without Matthew, or do without Mark? How could you possibly come to that conclusion if you'd bothered to read the Gospels? 
events in Matthew that are boiled down to their bare essentials. When you read them in Mark, you see a lively, expansive style. You see all kinds of extra picturesque details that Mark has provided. Also, let's turn that question around. Why would Matthew have needed to rely on Mark? Why would Matthew have ever relied on Mark? Matthew was an eyewitness from the beginning. Well, some respond that, well, Mark got his material from Peter. So Matthew really wasn't relying on Mark. Matthew was relying on Peter, and Peter was in the inner circle. But then how do we explain that Matthew contains events from Peter's life that are found in no other gospel, including not found in Mark? For example, Peter walking on the water in chapter 14, or Peter's great confession in chapter 16. They're not found in Mark. Up until just recently, the almost unanimous view was that Matthew was the earliest gospel. And I see no reason to depart from that view. I think Matthew was the earliest gospel. It's supported by the text. It's supported by the ancient extra-biblical evidence. For example, Clement of Alexandria, he said that the first gospels to be written were the ones that contained the genealogies. That means Matthew and Luke both came before Mark. Well, that only answers half our question, though. Were the Gospels written independently, or were they copying each other? Must we conclude that any of them were based on any of the others? And the answer is no, not at all. We don't have to conclude that. I don't care what the modern scholars say. Let's read the text. We don't have to conclude that. When one bothers to read the Gospels, what we discover is that there's no need at all to conclude that one copied from another. And in fact, when you read the Gospels, you'll find out exactly what is behind the similarities. It's not copying. It's John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. If you're wondering why the Gospels have similarities, read the Gospels. Look at John. He explains why they're similar. The simplest and best answer for why the Gospels often use similar language or identical language is that ultimately they were each penned by the same author, God, through the Holy Spirit. Each of the Gospel accounts is inspired by God word for word by the Holy Spirit. God breathes. That explains the similarities. Now, it's true that if we were to conclude that Matthew and Luke copied something from Mark, that alone does not deny inspiration because Mark is inspired and if the Holy Spirit guided Matthew and Luke to copy from an inspired text into another inspired text, well, we still have inspiration. That alone would not deny inspiration. But most critics who argue for dependence do not believe in any sort of inspiration. They argued that these books were written much later than the events they described. They argued they were not written by the people whose names appear at the top, and they were not written, they argue, by eyewitnesses. So we need to look at the agenda of those who are arguing that these books depend upon each other and were copied wholesale from one another. It's not a coincidence that this view of Mark's priority, meaning it came first, and Luke's dependence and Matthew's dependence on Mark, came at the same time that scholars were abandoning all supernatural explanations for the text in favor of humanistic, naturalistic explanations. That's not a coincidence. No so-called scholar today will keep his job for very long if he bases a theory on the divine origin of the biblical text. And yet, as with supernatural explanations for our own origin, the supernatural explanation is the true explanation. The books of the Bible are not like any other books on earth. Their origin is divine. They are not simply the product of men, and they must not be studied as such. You cannot explain the origin of the world apart from God. You cannot explain the origin of the word apart from God. Any attempt to do so is doomed to failure. Why do we have four Gospels? Why do we have four Gospel accounts? We know from Galatians there's only one Gospel, but as we often do, we refer to the four Gospel accounts by the shorthand, four Gospels. 
Well, we know that God intended us to have four gospel accounts rather than just one, because we have four, so God must have intended that. But why? Well, certainly part of the answer is that each of them has a different emphasis. And if you look at the handout today, you'll see a little graph from a very good book entitled, Is There a Synoptic Problem? The author concludes there is not. It's a very good book. But in one of the items from that book is this graph that kind of shows the different emphases of the, of the first three Gospels. And that's certainly one reason we have more than one. But I think there's another reason also. We can find it also from the pages of the Bible. You can go all the way back to Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 15. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Jesus mentions that same principle in Matthew 18, verse 16. 1 John chapter 5 tells us about the importance of testimony. Peter tells us about the importance of the apostolic testimony in Acts chapter 10, verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, Peter says. That was important. That was the testimony, the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. The Gospels contain testimony about Jesus, and that testimony is best established by multiple independent witnesses, and that's what we have. Saying that Matthew and Luke simply took up Mark and copied it down, that undercuts the value of their testimony. And that is particularly true for Matthew's apostolic testimony. Why would an apostle need to pick up and copy from Mark? He was an apostle. He was there from the beginning. That's his testimony. <clears throat> and in fact, if you look at Luke chapter 1, you'll see that Luke says... He consulted various sources in preparing his gospel account. There's no such indication in Matthew, nor would we expect there to be, would we? Because Matthew was there from the beginning. Was the book written before or after A.D. 70? You're going to see that debate on every book in the New Testament. A.D. 70, as we know, of course, was when Jerusalem was destroyed, and that's a huge debate as to when the books were written, before or after that watershed event. Um, we looked at that, for example, when we studied the book of Revelation in this auditorium not too long ago. And we've looked at that for other New Testament books as well. But that is a question we see when we come to the book of Matthew. I have a lot of notes in here on that. I won't have time to go over all of them here today. Again, you can pull that up from thywordistruth.com. But let me say this. One of the things that modern scholars say when it comes to this question is they look at Matthew 24 and say, well, this has to have been written after the fall of Jerusalem because look here, we have a prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem. And if it happened before, then we'd have supernatural prophecies in the Bible. We can't have that. It must have been written after the fact. That's what they say. There are so many problems with that. But let me start with the biggest problem. When Matthew wrote Matthew 24, the prophecy against Jerusalem is not the question with regard to whether it's a supernatural prophecy. The question is, when did Jesus say it? And Jesus said it, of course, much, much earlier than A.D. 70, uh, way back in the, in the near A.D. 30. So if the scholars are saying, well, Matthew just made it up after A.D. 70, then we have a lot bigger problem than the fact that it's not a real prophecy because we have Matthew making up things that Jesus supposedly said, in which case, what does it matter when it was written? I mean, these scholars are just all over the map here. Once you throw out the inspiration of the text, I look at them and I say, why are you still studying it? I mean, why are you going through all this problem if you've tossed out the inspiration of the text? So if the text is inspired and we have the actual words of Christ, as we do, then whenever Matthew 24 was written, it's describing something Jesus said long before A.D. 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed. So that's the biggest problem I see with it. Um, but there is another problem, and that is that the evidence supports an earlier date than A.D. 70 for Matthew 24, and for all of Matthew, in fact. If you look at the evidence, the best evidence says that Matthew was written sometime between A.D. 38 and A.D. 69. Now, there's an, another very good book I recommend. It's also listed there on the handout called Eyewitness to Jesus. And that book is all about three little fragments of a papyrus that are shown on the handout, the Magdalene papyrus, containing fragments of Matthew 26, and you can see them there. Some scholars have dated that papyrus to A.D. 60, which would mean that is the earliest, earliest papyrus we have showing any part of the New Testament. And in fact, that would also say that all these liberal views on when Matthew was written long after A.D. 70, some of them even putting it long into the next century, 
couldn't possibly be the case because we have a fragment of it from A.D. 60, if this, these scholars are correct. Very interesting book. I think Matthew was certainly written before A.D. 70, uh, but again, I don't say that because of Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 goes all the way back to when Jesus said it, which was certainly long before A.D. 70. I say that because of the evidence here and also because Matthew contains Matthew 24. Matthew 24 contains warnings to Christians, things to look out for when Jerusalem was attacked and destroyed by the Romans. Why would they have put that in after A.D. 70? There's only one gospel of the four that does not contain that. That's the gospel of John. And that's the only one, I believe, that was written after A.D. 70. Why was Matthew written? Well, we can see many different themes in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, all agree that the primary intended initial audience for Matthew was the Jews. Matthew, along with Hebrews, is perhaps the most Jewish book in the New Testament. And on the one hand, Matthew includes some of the most exclusive texts in all the Bible. Only he includes Jesus' statements in chapter 10 and chapter 15 that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, the Samaritans are mentioned only one time in Matthew, and it's the instructions in chapter 10 to not go to the Samaritans. But on the other hand, Matthew contains some of the most inclusive texts in all the Gospels. Only he has the Gentile wise men coming to pay homage to the child king in chapter 2. Only he speaks of Israel being judged and replaced by another people in chapter 21. Only Matthew tells us about events such as the healing of the centurion slave and the daughter of the Canaanite woman. Matthew even lists Gentile women, Rahab and Ruth, in the genealogy of Jesus. And only Matthew's book ends with the great commission to reach all nations with the gospel. At the end of Matthew, it's obedience to Jesus' commands that makes a true disciple, not obedience to the law of Moses. We often say that Matthew's gospel was addressed primarily to Jews, and it was. But part of that message to was, was to remind the Jews of something they should have known all along, and that is that the promised Messiah would be a blessing to the entire world, all the way back to Genesis 22, verse 18. They should have already known that. And Matthew is reminding them of that. That message rings out from the very first pages of the New Testament. That message rings out from the genealogy of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? When we see Rahab, when we see Ruth, the promised blessing to the whole world. We see that on the first page of the New Testament. That is a theme in Matthew. Another major theme is fulfillment. The Old Testament casts a very long shadow over Matthew's gospel. No other New Testament writer, including Paul, drew upon the Old Testament as much as Matthew did. And some have called that the central theme of Matthew. Matthew repeatedly cites Old Testament passages, over half of them not cited in any other of the four Gospels. One-fifth of Matthew's quotations are from Isaiah. Uh, no other no Old Testament book influenced Matthew as much as Isaiah did. Uh, Isaiah is another book that we studied here in the auditorium not long ago. And if you go to the website, thywordistruth.com, you'll find those lessons. In fact, all of those lessons are there in video. So you can watch those on video or audio or read the class notes. And no other Old Testament book influenced Matthew as much as Isaiah. Some modern commentators, though, and again, they're always on the attack, it seems. They accuse Matthew of taking some of these Old Testament passages out of context and applying them to events they were never intended to describe. Here's how one wrote the charge. He said, Such texts owe their presence in Matthew's gospel, not to any messianic significance they possessed in their own right, but to his imaginative perception of Old Testament pre-echoes of details in the stories of Jesus. How do we respond to charges like that? Well, first, 
Applying an Old Testament prophecy to Christ does not mean it did not also have a more immediate application back at the time it was written. We know that to be the case about some of the Old Testament prophecies. There would be an immediate application, but the Holy Spirit guiding the prophet would also be looking far down the ages, and when he wrote the prophecy, he would be having a dual fulfillment, one immediate and one fulfilled in Christ. We see that in the Psalms, for example. We see that throughout some of the other prophets. So saying there is an immediate application at the time it was written does not mean that it can't also apply to Christ, because we know that's the case for many of the prophecies. But second, and more importantly, we come back to the origin of this text. Where did it come from? Who wrote it? Who guided the authors? Holy Spirit, inspiration. If the New Testament tells us that an Old Testament prophecy applies to Christ, then that Old Testament prophecy applies to Christ, period. If we're the ones that think it doesn't, then we're the ones that are twisting it. We're the ones who are wrong. We're the ones who've taken a left turn, not Matthew. Matthew was being guided by the Holy Spirit, and if Matthew says the Old Testament prophecy applied to Christ, then that ends that discussion. And if we're going to throw the supernatural origin of the text out the window, then again I have to ask, what does it matter what Matthew wrote? The reason it matters is because of the origin of the text. It's inspired by God. This is the word of God. God wrote the Old Testament. He wrote the Old Testament prophecy. He wrote the New Testament, explaining the Old Testament prophecy. So if the New Testament says that's what it applies to, then that's what it applies to. Third theme, the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven occurs throughout the book of Matthew throughout the book of Matthew. 32 times we read about the kingdom of heaven. He also talks about the kingdom of God five times, the kingdom five times. Even once in prayer, we, we see the phrase, your kingdom. He uses expressions like the kingdom of their father, the kingdom of my father, uh, and he refers to the kingdom of the Son of Man. Throughout the book of Matthew, we see the kingdom over and over and over and over again. Uh, Ten times he records parables of Christ that begin, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells us what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of God runs throughout the gospel of Matthew. Uh, there's a special lesson on the web that I gave just on that, same, that very point, the kingdom of God, and what is it? It's in our collection of lessons on the church that you can look up. I have a lot more to say about it there. But the kingdom of heaven, that theme runs all throughout the gospel of Matthew. Perhaps no text is more striking than chapter 11, verse 11, which relegates John the Baptist to a lesser status than everyone in the kingdom because he did not live to see its inauguration. Something great, something wonderful was right around the corner at the time Matthew was being written and the time Jesus was saying this particularly. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. Something big was coming. The kingdom was at hand. It comes throughout the gospel of Matthew. In fact, a unique feature of Matthew's gospel is what is called the ecclesiastical text, and that's found in chapter 16, verse 18. And in fact, if you look at your handout, you will see that in one of the very earliest manuscripts, the Vaticanus manuscript, which you can see in the British Museum. If you've ever, ever been there, you'll see it in a big display case, um, and this is from a page from that showing Matthew 16, verse 18, called the ecclesiastical text. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. That's found in Matthew. That's found nowhere else in the, in the four Gospels. And that passage has influenced the history of Christianity uh, on earth as much as perhaps any other passage. And sometimes for good and ill. It's been very badly misunderstood, for example, by the Catholics who point to Peter as that rock. Whereas we know that that rock was the confession that Peter made. In fact, if you keep reading in Matthew 16, you'll see Jesus refer to Peter as Satan, not a few, just a few verses later. It seemed like an awfully thin rock to build a kingdom on. That kingdom was built on the confession Peter made, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And that text appears in Matthew's gospel and not in the others. Final major theme of Matthew is not just the kingdom, but is the kingship of Jesus Christ. The kingship of Jesus Christ, the reign of Christ. Throughout his gospel, Matthew focuses on Jesus' identity as the incarnate Son of God, 
Jesus is the promised king of Israel who has come to usher in the kingdom of heaven. Only Matthew's gospel shows Jesus referring to the coming kingdom as his church. Only Matthew's gospel uses the word church among the four gospels in reference to that coming kingdom. And as I mentioned, Matthew 16, verse 18, we talk about the Lord's church. We talk about it not being our church, being his church. That comes from the gospel of Matthew most clearly. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus says, it's my church, the Lord's church. The first book in the, ver in the, in the book gives perhaps the greatest title for Jesus. He is the Christ, the anointed of God, the messianic king. That's why we call ourselves Christians. He is the Christ. One of the most distinctive titles for Christ in Matthew is the son of David. Again, that royal theme, King David. Matthew uses the name King David 17 times, more than any other book in the New Testament. The title Son of David occurs nine times, eight of which have no parallel in any of the other gospel accounts. That title never occurs outside of the first three gospels, although Romans 1-3 comes close. Matthew also frequently uses the phrase son of man, which is perhaps the phrase Jesus most often used of himself. I think deliberately ambiguous. He wanted people to think about what does that mean, son of man? Those who first heard it may have thought of Ezekiel because God referred to Ezekiel 90 times as the son of man. But I think they also thought about Daniel, the son of man in Daniel, who appears as the glorified king before the ancient of days, the Son of Man. And when we reach Jesus' final use of that title in chapter 26, there is no doubt that it refers to the divine Messiah of Israel. Matthew also uses the title Son of God in reference to Christ. And one commentator describes that as perhaps the key title for Christ in the book of Matthew. We see it at his birth in chapter 2. We see it at his temptation in chapter 4. We see it as his recognition by the disciples in chapter 14 and chapter 16. We see it at his death in chapter 26 and 27. That title more than any other points to Christ's unique relationship to God the Father. He was the Son of God, that unique relationship to God the Father. Jesus refers to God as his Father 23 times in the Gospel of Matthew, 15 of which are not found in any of the other Gospel accounts. <clears throat> The wise men come looking for who? For whom in chapter 2? The king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. And they found him, didn't they? They found him. The triumphal entry, what was that intended to show except the king entering the city? The king entering the city. Before Pilate, Jesus accepted the name of king, chapter 27. And even on the cross, that title was affixed above his head, albeit in mockery. The king had arrived to usher in his kingdom. The final claim of Jesus in the book of Matthew, all authority has been given unto me. You tell me who can say that except a king. One commentary said, Matthew's picture of Jesus is of the man born to be king. Jesus walks through his pages as if in the purple and gold of royalty. That, I think, is the major theme of the book of Matthew. The king ushering in his kingdom. We see it in the other gospels, but we see it most clearly in the gospel of Matthew. And if you then want to see when that kingdom was established and when that church was established, you go to the book of Acts. And that's where we have the establishment of that kingdom. I thank you so much for your attention here this morning. Um, we're going to, as you know, have co-teachers in this class. Uh, you won't see me again till the final three lessons of the, of the quarter, in which I will be talking about the Passover, about the death of that king, and about the resurrection of that king. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Again, these notes will be available on the internet site, thywordistruth.com. Thank you.